enough space in the bag for everybody to be comfortable.
So, but when I met him, and he said, no, 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 I won't, he, he, I won't come, that's what he said. But then I tried to convince him that he should come. <laughs> and finally, he decided uh, he promised me to come, and I'm really happy that he, that he could make it. And then, 2002, I remember that he wrote a very interesting journal paper. Uh, it, it was in Nature, right? And he said, uh, why, you know, Roomba and another uh, interesting uh, robots and uh, chemical uh, reactions never become life. It's a semi-life, I, I, I must say, semi-life, but never becomes a full ground life. And he said, there may be four factors. One is, as I remember, maybe the computational power is still low, low or maybe the complexity of the uh, model is not complex enough. Well, maybe too many parameters, as you know, the artificial life model has too many parameters, and then we don't have the, uh, the right parameter set, that's why we can't make it. Well, maybe he said, there might be a fundamental principle that we are still missing in, in our theory, and then I've been thinking of it for many, many years now. Um, and also, I, I named the Brooks Juice, uh, that we need a final impact, a final drop, drop it to make semi-life into life. So that's, I, uh, but yesterday I discussed with him, but he didn't know this was called Brooks Hughes. <laughs> I thought he named it, but. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, let me introduce, um, please, Brooks. Thank you, 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 uh, nice cool weather, and I can see that. So I, 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 I actually want to. I actually am going to talk about the juice today, um, but I'm going to come out of a slightly different way. But uh, as the guys have said, you know, I, I, I was in an artificial life early on. I was uh, uh, artificial life four, which was at MIT, which I was the general chair of, and we had the proceedings. But then I largely left. Um, artificial life, and I've been doing other stuff for the last uh, 20 plus years. Um, I started building humanoid robots in the, in the early 1990s. Carl um, uh, on the left, and then with my student Cynthia Brazil, uh, Kismet on the right, doing social interaction with robots. And then I accidentally became an academic administrator and formed the Computer Science and AI Lab at MIT, which is the largest lab there. And then, because I had this lab with a thousand people, we needed a building, so I had to build a building, and that took a few years. Uh, now, but there's an interesting story here. This is the, this is the building we built, where Frank Gehry was the architect, and you can see that it's not con completely conventional. Um, and many surfaces are, are, are come together in funny angles. You can see there on the left and on the right. Uh, but in order to keep the cost down, we, we had to have a standard-sized piece of metal to cover them. And the way that uh, it was computed for where to put them was with a genetic algorithm. And even better, the architect who came up with the genetic algorithm had learned about genetic algorithms in my A-Life class at MIT. <laughs> so A-Life was used to build this building. But uh, then I uh, went on and built the, the uh, Cumbia robot. We, we made the Roomba, which is uh, the biggest selling um, uh, Robot vacuum cleaner in the world. Japan has a great market for it. We also uh, built uh, uh, robots to go into um, horrible places. Um, it's now spun off into a company called Endeavor Robotics. On the left there, you see one of the robots in Fukushima, Daiichi. Uh, we got the robots there on March 20th. It was still a lot unknown, and getting the robots in there, setting up Wi Fi hotspots, because the, 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 uh, Dai, the uh, Fukushima plant. Is not digital, it was just analog dials, places, and you couldn't, people couldn't go because the radiation was too high. So we got the, the robots out there to put a camera on the analog dial and then use hotspots to, to jump back. I actually went into uh, Fukushima in 2014, it was quite, quite uh, sobering. And more recently, I've been building um, robots for factories, but unlike conventional industrial robots, they, uh, there's two things that differentiate them. One is they're safe to be next to, no cages. And the second is you don't program them. Let me, uh, and, and, and that not programming is a theme that I spent many years on because all the end users for these robots, be they home robot, the robots that the military use for roadside bombs, 
or like those two guys on the right in a factory in Connecticut, 10 person factory, those two guys are machinists. They were in charge of putting the robot there. They didn't know how to program, so we had to make a way for them to be able to use the robots without programming. Here's, here's just a, a little uh, uh, 60 seconds of the, the current robots. I want to show you what, what I've been doing for the last few years, and then I'll get on to ALAC. This is um, the Soya robot, which is the second robot we built doing um, tasks with, in each case, these robots were trained by people in the factory. This is a, this is a little, this cutting wood is a, a little factory that makes rubber stamps, and they're very pleased because the workers don't have to put their fingers near the, the saw bands anymore. Um, uh, but the, these robots doing, doing um, simple tasks, the eyes on the screen, the robot glances where it's about to move, gives a clue to the person who's working with it, and you'll see it. Uh, flashing lights, it's got cameras in its hand, on its arm, uh, keeping track of parts, etc. Uh, but all of these tasks were done without, without programming, uh, whereas conventional industrial robots have horrible, horrible programming languages. Um, I, I know one of the major manufacturers is trying to change their robot programming language from one based on Pasca, Pasca, Pascal, 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 how do you say it? Pascal. Pascal. Yeah, Pascal, they're trying to change from that to Java. They're really, you know, they're going from a 30 year old system to a 10 year old system. Uh, um, but our, our robots uh, use behavior trees. Uh, I'm sort of well known for subsumption, which was uh, an architecture that I developed in the early 80s. In, in the year 2000, um, um, Damien Isler, who works at my company now, uh, was a student of Bruce Blumberg, and some of you may know Bruce from the simulation of that behavior days. Uh, uh, also works in the company. He, he came up with a formalism called behavior trees, which subsumes subsumption. Um, and behavior trees are now power two thirds of the world's video games. So it's a well known technology. Lots of people are writing code in behavior trees. But we built a, a, a new version of our interactive software. Um, uh, it's the way that our robots are programmed. You show the robot something, and some little buttons on the, on the side of the the cuff there, and it infers because there was nothing in its hand, and you said close the fingers, and then there was something in its hand, that must have been a pick. Here it infers that it must have been a place, and it automatically builds a behavior tree. The user doesn't have to look at the behavior tree if they don't want to. Um, but it builds up this behavior tree with lots of error conditions, lots of handling, um, and for an expert user, they can go in and look at the behavior tree and modify it if they want to. Um, but they're not writing lines of code. Um, and as the program uh, operates, you, you can actually, the green nodes are active, but this is a parallel architecture, so there can be lots of green nodes. That's how you get parallelism between lots of processes as in subsumption. Um, and sorry for some of the, the words here, it's marketing high, but uh, uh, you can go in and, and click on things um, and, uh, and, and go down and, and, uh, and modify anything you want, even though the system tries to do a little bit of AI, tries to infer what you want, and comes up with defaults as it builds this automatic program uh, for you. But you can go in and change things. Um, so here, they, the person wants to change it, it was a pick and place. They, they say, oh, okay, I want to put a pattern there now. Uh, the blue notes mean that you have to put something in. Here, he's showing up the pattern. Uh, unfortunately, this video doesn't match the uh, what we'll see in a second, because I had to get rid of a secret robot here for this video. Uh, video and show you what we've actually got. So, um, and so he shows up the corners. Now it knows the coordinate system. It can use vision to locate that um, uh, tray. Um, here's an interface that's on the head of the robot, where you can change the, the size and how many layers in the box, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how you're going to fill the box, etc. So you can do anything you can do with conventional robot programming language in this visual uh, language, although you don't actually have to eat, ever look at the visual language and control forces. This is why it's safe to interact with, the, with people in the, in the real world here. It's, it's just measuring very small forces when the fingers are in the way uh, and it detects that something's not as it wanted with its uh, forward model of kinematics and dynamics. Um, so, uh, and uh, I'll just was just showing, uh, you know, we have the eyes on the robot. Some of our customers hate having eyes on the robot. They think that's too weird, not industrial enough. So now we let them put data on that 
face of the robot. <laughs> the customer is always right, uh, even though the customer is wrong. But details, details, details. Um, so that's uh, what I've been doing the last few years. But now let's go back to um, artificial life, because it's always been close to my heart. Uh, and, and for me, artificial life is, is, is inspired by biology and inspired by prebiology, and I've seen talks and posters about both of these here. So I made this slide up last week. I'm glad that my reality is not too far off, although Jordan can yell at me if I've got anything wrong here or miss something out. Um, uh, I think epigenetics is relatively new. It wasn't around in, in artificial life 20 some years ago, but everyone's now knows how important that is. Um, but people in A life and AI are implicitly operating under the philosophy of reductive materialism, or if you like, materialistic reductionism. Uh, reductionism. Now, what, is, what does this mean? Um, reductionism is belief that every complex phenomenon can be explained by analyzing the simplest physical mechanisms that are in operation during the phenomenon. Um, so it's physical. That's what people implicitly assume, I think, in both AI and AI. Um, and the belief that matter and its motions constitute the universe and all its phenomena, including mind, as due to material agencies. And I think that's implicitly, if I don't say it explicitly, I think that's sort of the underlying assumption of both AI and AI. And is everyone a reductive materialist, or is it just us weirdos? Um, people know Thomas Nagel. Does anyone remember this paper? What's it like to be a bat? Very famous paper. Um, with a big influence on many of us. Um, uh, he talked about, you know, the bat has different sensor, sensors than us. It, it sees the world differently. But he wanted to know what's it like to be a bat. Not what it's like for us to imagine being a bat, but what it's like to be a bat. And the bad part about the paper is it never tells you the answer. So, uh, puts the question out. So Thomas Nyla was a, you know, a hero of mine, but he's got a new book out, so I read it. And he's not a materialist reductionist, a materialistic reductionist. And he, he says, no, it can't be. That can't be. There's other stuff. Can't be what everyone says. Evolution can't work the way it does. Um, um, he, he doesn't necessarily demand to be a god, but he says that there has to be some more types in the universe that we don't understand. Um, and he, he can't believe physical or chemical reductionism can explain either the evolutionary history of life nor the origin of life. And he can't believe that mind arises from the realm of matter. And I think he's wrong, but it made me think, reading his, 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 his book, you know, he says there's just not enough time in, 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 ge in geological time for us to have evolved. He says, couldn't have happened. And I don't think he understands the robustness of life <coughs> to a large variation of parameters of operation. And I don't think he understands big numbers, because geological time and the Earth has big, big numbers. I don't think he gets either of them. And, and the origin of life, he says, well, you know, there's no natural selection before you have life, so therefore it can't have evolved, but of course we saw uh, posters here, papers here, on, on prebiotic processes and how they come about. Um, and I don't think he understands the sieving of non-biological specimens that happens in, in physical systems. And I don't think he understands the ratchet effect that just arises out of order, out of little rules put together, which is intrinsically what we're trying to get at. Um, and then he says, mind-brain dualism. Uh, Materialism is the view that only the physical world is irreducibly real, and that such a place must be found in the mind. The task has come up with an alternative, and it's a series of failures. He starts with an assumption that mind is qualitatively different from other things in the world. And he talks about brain state, um, you know, how can a brain state be pain and, uh, you know, there be pain at the same time. But if you apply his argument, uh, it, it, it rules out computation happening in the physical world. But computation does happen in the physical world. But now we get to a little bit of trickiness. Um, he hypothesizes other type in the universe, something about intelligence, consciousness, which is different from all the types we know. And once you hypothesize other types, they can be magical. Once they're magical, they can do anything. Um, but he's not the only one who's done that. But I think he has two metaphors that he gets from his 
really mistakes. He, he sort of thinks that anything of randomness is undifferentiated mush, and that's what a life is about. How randomness is not undifferentiated mush. That's a key thing that we use. And it's, he, he thinks a thing is a fixed set of parts with a fixed relationship between them. And if you do that, you can't you can't describe computation. So I think some philosophers are victims of metaphor. Horrible, horrible. <laughs> Victims of metaphor. Metaphors. Well, you know, uh, George Lakoff uh, has a, a little bit of a political rebound in the US today trying to explain uh, the metaphors that Donald Trump lives by um, and his use of language. Uh, he he, he and, and, and Mark Johnson have had a series of books about how us humans use metaphors to explain everything to ourselves. We use metaphors, you know, we move forward, we make progress, is about us walking. Time flows past us. We use those metaphors in our language, and we use those metaphors to think about things. When we're thinking about a problem, we use metaphors, even if it's a complex philosophical problem, we, we think about places and, and putting things here and putting things there. We, we reason geometrically about the world. We project our problem with the sort of naive geometric reasoning that we're all good at. Um, and so the, these things that, 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 that Nagel had wrong, I think, are, are wrong about computation and wrong about some other sort of type. Okay, so I'm sort of saying, well, Nagel said this wrong stuff, but it really gets me thinking. We talk about computation. How does computation work in the material world? We use metaphors when we think about computation. For instance, well, if we talk about a C struct, it's, it's a thing, and it's got some slots in it, and you can put numbers in there, or you can put, uh, uh, you know, uh, symbols in there if you use uh, the right sort of defines or, or enumerated types. So each of those, those the, that partition contains, each partition has a name and a type. It's independently accessible and modifiable. Uh, we can reference the whole thing as an object, a struct, an instance, we can, in our program. And, but sometimes we break the abstraction barrier because we know the compiler does smart little things and puts extra bytes in there between our types of our containers. We have to use size off to, to make sure the compiler didn't fool us. You know, we want to copy it. You know. So there's an abstraction, but we know it's a bit messy. But what, what about in, in reality? What's the reality of that struct? And this is where Nagel just gets completely confused thinking about mine, but it's just as bad for computation. You know, um, where, where is the material reality of the struct in our program? Is it in the source code? Is it the machine code the compiler produces? Is it in the memory of the processor? Where, where is it? John? Where it runs, it's in the memory. Oh, it's in the memory. Really? Well, first, you know, if you look at the x86, you know, the, the processes that run out, uh, or, or, uh, PCs and our, and our, um, and our um, Macintoshes, the x86, uh, the architectural instructions, the machine code, are interpreted by another architecture below it, which we don't know about, no one tells us what's down there. Um, the registers are dynamically allocated at runtime, and they're different. And in fact, there may be up to 180, uh, this, this number just came out in, a, in, a, in, a, in the most recent communication of the ACM, there's a little paper there. This number's really astounding. There may be up to 180 instructions in flight, in parallel, on a single core. So you know, we think of instructions as these sequential with branches, and in compiled C code as a branch, roughly every seven instructions or so. But in our modern architectures, the reason they get so hot, is they're predicting 180 instructions ahead. Most of them are wrong. They're doing them speculatively, and then they're going away. And the recent, um, the recent uh, uh, hacks that have, that have caused confusion is because there's ways to peek inside and see what went wrong with some of those instructions. So they're looking 23 branches ahead, trying to predict what's going on. And then there's a three-level cache, so that memory is smeared out in space and time. There is no memory. It's, it's all over the place. Different parts of that same container, the reality of them, are in speculative states all over the place. So it's not, we've got a metaphor that we use, which is not like the reality below. 
So even for computation, which we think is a simple, solid, the world is more complex. Now there's other metaphors in science besides computation. <coughs> um, physicists, I think you know some physicists. Physical intuition has served uh, physicists as well when the physics was about the world we live in. But quantum world, eh, not so much. That physical intuition hasn't been so good. Um, you know, you know this, it's quite the right way, light is a particle, light is a wave. We're trying to get metaphors that we understand. We understand waves, we understand particles, quantum world must be something that we can talk about. Um, and that just has caused into a trouble. Instead of thinking about it as a solution to a Schrodinger, the Schrodinger equation, um, and thinking about what dynamics it has, we keep trying to think about it in our metaphoric terms. We, we are this processor or something here that's only got limited capability, and so we always try to think about things in that way. Now here's some slides I found online. These are not my slides, but you know, it leads to what are the, what are the interpretations for quantum mechanics, the Copenhagen interpretation, you know, uh, the, all the ridiculous in my world, many worlds interpretation. If you've got probabilities, they all must happen because you know, and it leads to all sorts of bizarre notions. And we're worried that uh, we're worried that Jordan just got stabbed in an alternative world. Because it could have happened. Sorry, Jordan, you're dead. It's <laughs> um, uh, so many different interpretations, and I think it's because we're trying to reduce it to something of the metaphors we can use. So some physicists are victims of metaphor, too. It's, ter it's terrible. It's metaphors. Bad, bad. So are AI life and AI research as victims of metaphor? Or are we the one group of scientists who are not victims of bad metaphors? You know, we've had metaphors about the progress of man, and we, we're smart enough to know that, you know, that progress is not evolution, uh, so we you know, get around that. Um, but uh, we may be doing things without realizing. We may be, maybe our experiments are in totally unrealistic regimes in AI life. And we ramp up the probabilities of events in order to get something useful to happen in the lifetime of a PhD uh, project. And, and maybe by putting those, putting that much noise into the system, we're in a totally different regime than where the real stuff happens in real evolution, and real artificial intelligence. We want to see it happen. So we've, we've got all these parameters in the wrong place. Focusing on local, local optimization instead of global diversity, we heard about that uh, yesterday. Where we can is um, open-ended evolution. Um, we, we may be playing in spaces. All our simulations are, uh, are such simple dynamics. We're missing the real stuff, the really important things that happen. And then I think this one where we are really guilty of the worries. We make an equivalence between materialistic explanations and computational explanations. And is that justified? Is that at all justified? And then I think we fail to see commonalities across many behaviors because we mentally bucket them into different places. Uh, and that's hard for our little, you know, it's been hard for physicists to think about quantum mechanics, it's hard for our little brains to think about. And so I'm going to talk a little more about these last two. Is computation sufficient to model what interests us in AI? Like? Just about everyone here uses computation as their engine. Is that sufficient? Let's look at these polyclad flatworms. These are, if you're a diver, um, you've probably seen these on coral reefs. They're little tiny things. They, they can be very many colors. They're beautiful. But they've only got a, they've got a brain. It's only 2,000 neurons. Um, and all their learning is temporary. They don't seem to remember anything longer than about 10 minutes, but they do learn. Um, They've got, a, uh, they've got these little ruffles, so they sort of, you see them you know, going along on, on the coral reef. They've got a, a little uh, eye spot, calling it my 2,000 neurons is going a bit far, but it's an eye spot, sensitive to light. And then uh, they've got this mouth and, and um, a few things uh, leading into their intestine, um, and uh, they feed uh, directly in, into it. Here's a few pictures of the different ones. Um, and this is what they look like internally. They've got these four longitudinal nerve cords, and then right up the top there, they've got this little tiny brain with 2,000 neurons. And you can see the, you can see the, the four longitudinal 
Nerve cords come in and go out the other end too, uh, and the eye is there. This is the brain with the 2,000 cells. Now, back in the late 1950s, early 1960s, these animals were so simple, they wanted to do experiments and see whether if one uh, individual learned something, and they transplanted the brain to another individual, whether the, the, what it learned went with the brain. You know, they're trying to isolate. Is the learning happening in the brain? Um, but I suspect, they never say why, but then there's a whole other literature that comes about with, about when you make a mistake with the brain transplant. I suspect a graduate student screwed up, and then they thought, oh, this is interesting. They never say why they, why they did this. By the way, you know, you think 2,000 neurons, ah, oh, we can simulate that, that's easy, but even C. elegans, which only has 282 neurons in the brain, another 20 in its gut, um, with the Open Worm Project. Is anyone here involved with Open Worm? Any ever heard of Open Worm? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, they've been going for years. We still don't have the simulations uh, of, of, of the behavior. So 2,000 neurons, 10 times big, no way we can do it. But these, these 2,000 neurons, when you cut, when you cut out the, the brain on one animal and you put it into another one, you know, with these longitudinal things like that, and here's the brain with them, if you put them in at 90 degrees, it's not going to work. But if you put them in this way, on top, maybe they can rejoin. Or if you put them in this way, maybe they can rejoin. Or if you put them in this way, or this way, maybe they can rejoin. So there's actually three ways uh, three wrong ways of putting the brain in the other creature when you do a brain transplant. Um, we're going to talk about AT in particular. Uh, but three ways you can do it. And then, they, so these were being studied, and not normal flatworm, three behaviors it has, they flip over when it's upside down, it's got a coordinated gait, and it can feed by turning towards where it senses food. When you get rid of the brain, by the way, the creature's fine, it's just dumb, <laughs> um, it only flips by chance, it doesn't gate, and it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't walk, and it doesn't do a ipsilateral turn, but it, but it lives. When you put the brain in, and you put it in all those wrong ways, all worms recover the ability to write. So you've got the, you've got the microprocessor chip, you put it in backwards and upside down, and the computation for flipping over still works. For locomotion, um, they get that uh, coordinated gait, but sometimes they walk backwards afterwards, and after about three days, some of them can then adapt and walk forward again. Well, that sort of makes sense, but raining backwards, maybe the, you know, the sequencing is wrong. And for feeding, only of the three wrong ways to put in the ipsilateral turn, only happens for one of those three ways, the other way, others never recover. But is computation the way to think about this? This doesn't fit our models of computation. That's not how computation works. You know, you, you, you randomize the arguments for a, a procedure call. It doesn't sort of adapt to it. It just gets it wrong. Um, so it's probably some sort of developmental process. After all, these brains didn't come fully fledged. They started with, you know, the whole creature was one cell at one time, and the brain grew bit by bit. And the cells had to communicate with each other and build the, the network to the development process. And the development process is still probably happening at some level as you do this brain transplant. But I don't think computation is the right metaphor for that. So, actually, evolutionarily, where did neurons come from? Uh, if you look at cross creatures, well, what is a neuron? Well, there's no one definition that works for all neurons. There's, there's, uh, uh, any, any feature you put in a neuron, you can find a creature that doesn't have that particular feature. So even, even the, uh, the um, axon going out and reaching, you know, we have axons from here down to our muscles and our toes. There are some, some neurons that don't have an axon at all. They just don't have any output process. It's the dendrites going to come onto the cell. Um, so there's different ones. They, early creatures have discharge, electrical discharge across the surface of cells. And maybe neurons evolved to control that electrical discharge better. If you take this jellyfish, Aurelia, it has swimming and feeding behaviors. And when you look inside, it's got two completely separate nervous systems with different sorts of neurons for the two behaviors. It's got, it's got one for the swimming, and it's got one for the feeding. And the, the 
trick with the swimming is the whole creature has to uh, contract at the same time. And so if you've got this central sequencer, how do you get them all in sync? And there's a couple of different ways, different versions do it. Some, they use very fast propagation. Others, the, uh, the uh, spikes attenuate and the latency of the muscle compression is inversely proportional to the strength of the signal that comes. So the further off ones fire quicker than the closer ones which get the signal earlier. Um, and again, this is not exactly an information processing metaphor. It's about oscillation and maintaining stable oscillation across a, a physically distributed system. And so maybe there's different metaphors, force and attraction for feeding the way they operate. I didn't talk about that in any detail. An oscillator for swimming is the, is the right metaphor. Is it not computation? You know, you can push computation as a metaphor for all sorts of things. Jerry Sussman at the AL at MIT told me there's a whole book about simulating physical systems as information systems. So in his view, Mercury and the Sun are exchanging information about gravity uh, computationally. I don't think that's the best way to think about it. I think you know, traditional physics is Newtonian physics is a much crisp, crisper way to think about it. Um, so maybe, maybe these brains are not computational so much. In a life, and I grab these up for web, you know, our cellular systems, we view them as computational systems. There's the, the loops that Chris Langton came up with, which was a brilliant innovation for reproduction. And then we have more complex behaviors. We have, we, some of the people talked about, you know, uh, Tom Ray yesterday. But they're all computational uh, metaphors. Is computation enough? For, for what we're doing? Or are we making a mistake? We know it's not enough for quantum mechanics. Traditional, we know that. Traditional computation can't do what a quantum computer can do. So there's an example when no matter how smart we think we are, us computer scientists, it's not enough, traditional computation. It's just not enough. Why is it enough for AI? Why is it enough for AI? Is it? I don't know. But I think it's a valid question. Because here's a case we know it's not enough. You know, we've got quantum, we've got Newton mechanics, we've got Turing computation, and you know, what sits on top of it, what, how this Venn diagram all works together is really confused, I think. Um, I don't know. Um, and then you can argue all sorts of ways that the Turing computation fits on top of Newtonian mechanics, and it's sort of got an abstraction of it, although we know that an individual transistor uses quantum effects to operate, but we've got a Newtonian approximation, and that's what we use in describing computation. We don't have to go traditional computation, we don't have to go to the quantum level, even though we know physically it's dependent on the quantum level. We're doing abstraction there. And, you know, the Church Turing thesis is what we have based our modern society on. That computation as we describe it, as, as Turing machines describe it, is sort of all there is about information processing. That's, and it's called the Church-Turing thesis. Because there's no theorems, there's no things that show you this. You can find plenty of arguments, all sorts of directions about this, whether it's real, whether it's not real, whether it's an assumption. Um, and, you know, and the Church-Turing thesis is, is sort of saying that any sort of simple physical thing that we come up with to describe computation, they're all the same. They have been historical. Uh, the the uh, recursive functions, lambda calculus, etc. But is that enough? We know it doesn't sound enough for quantum. By the way, this is, uh, this is uh, what computers used to be. See, that's the computing division, the computing section. And computers used to be people. And in uh, uh, Turing's 1936 paper, uh, where he describes computation and essentially comes up with the Turing machine, he talks about a man working with a piece of paper, and you know, there were men there, but they were actually mostly women who did computer, that's who computers were. They're following a set of rules, they've got paper, they put numbers in buckets, in squares, there's a set of rules that they follow, and that's what computation is. And that's what Turing was modeling. He was modeling a human computer. And his, what he said was, this machine can do anything that a person who's operating like these people can do. 
But, you know, we know this famous cartoon. Um, maybe we're just looking where the light is. We got that, we got that Turing stuff. It's really good. Um, that's where we're going to look for a, a life, because that's where the light is. Um, you know, I sort of think maybe computation, along with Moore's law, which we've had for the last 50 years, has been you know delivering higher and higher grade cocaine each year to us. And so you know we get a hit, oh, it works well. Next year we've got more computation. Uh, so we need a much stronger hit, to hit, not to be disappointed. But we've been getting those stronger hits every year. We get a stronger hit, so we, we're addicted to this cocaine of, 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 of computation. And you know Moore's law is sort of starting to run out in the classical sense, but. Along comes GPUs, you know, and specialized computation. And so we're still getting our hits. Yeah, 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 we're getting more, more, more of it. But maybe, you know, we've been off in a, in a side place that's going to run out. So, you know, are we victims of metaphor? I suspect we might be. Maybe there's some other, you know, there's another thing over here which we don't have a good description of yet. I don't know what it is. And maybe that is what we need in order to understand evolution, in order to understand what it is that neurons and people do. And this gets back to the paper that you mentioned. It was actually in 2001, Nature, volume 409, page 409, famous Beach Boy voice song about it. Some of you might remember. Remember that song, John? By 409, anyway. <laughs> I love it, it's 409, 409. Um, uh, so in this paper, I, I, I sort of talk about some of these issues, and, and, and I called it new stuff. The next year, 2002, in this book that came out, I called it the juice. So it was new stuff in 2001, in 2002, I called it the juice. I never called it Brooks's juice. I just called it the juice. <laughs> now, Roger Penrose, um, you know, has been looking for something extra, and he says, oh, it's, it's, it's quantum mechanics. And my, my cartoon of that is, Quantum mechanics is something we don't really understand, we don't really understand the brain, they must be the same thing. That's the whole unfair. But, by the way, have, have people seen the, uh, I, I put them on my, on, on my website, my MIT website, I've got a new page of historical documents. And I've got a couple of movies from Lionel Penrose with self-reproducing wooden machines. Has anyone seen those? I, I recommend downloading those movies. And, and Roger helps out with that. And the first one is really interesting, it's a little wooden machine and it self-reproduces. And then there's 19 more chapters that get more and more complex. So he was using wood, not computation, line of ten rows to do artificial life. David Chalmers, a well-known philosopher, is from my hometown, same hometown by the way, South Australia. He has for a long time been saying consciousness, there must be a new type in the universe. You know, maybe we've got mass, maybe we've got energy, maybe there's this type of consciousness. I don't buy it. But uh, other people are looking for other stuff. Inside that paper, I had to patch together little pieces, I, 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 I talked about what this new stuff could be, and I said, the new stuff doesn't have to be really complicated. Maybe it's no more complicated than computation. It's a way of thinking. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I said that a good late 19th century mathematician could understand computation with a few days' instruction. There'd be no surprises for them in the way that quantum mechanics and relativity would surprise a physicist from the late 19th century. They would be surprised by those two things. A mathematician from the late 19th century wouldn't be surprised by the description of computation and the theorem about computation. There's nothing weird. So maybe we don't have to look for anything weird. Maybe it's just a, a way of thinking. But by the way, in this, in this series of paragraphs here, I, I talked about how um, neuroscientists have been trying to understand the brain. And they use computation as a metaphor. And what We've been doing, and this was written in 2001, so I said for most of the 20th century, people have been poking electrons in brains and trying to look at the signals and correlate them across cells. If you tried that with a microprocessor and you didn't know about computation, would you be able to figure out how it worked? Well, someone did this experiment just in 2016. Um, and you're a neuroscientist to understand the microprocessor. They actually took old 6502s, they etched up the top of them, and they uh, got down to the MOS level uh, uh, transistors as they were laid out of the machine. They simulated them, and then they simulated putting electrodes in. And they ran 
uh, Donkey Kong, Space Invaders, and Pitfall as three programs. And they did lesion studies. So it turns out uh, there are 1,565 transistors of all the transistors you can just throw out, and those three programs still run. There's um, uh, 1,560 transistors. If you throw out any one of them, all three programs fail. But there's you know, 49 that only make Space Invaders fail, 98 that only make Donkey Kong fail. So you know, they're looking for the Donkey Kongness. Where's that? You know, in the which is what neuroscientists do. And they did all sorts of experiments. It's a great paper, I really recommend it. There's a dozen of these, you know, about looking at correlation across time. And wouldn't you know it? There's an underlying frequency that correlates across the system. Maybe this 6502 is conscious. That's one of the, that's one of the uh, hypotheses that neuroscientists have made, that this distributed, uh, in sync, um, 20 hertz or 10 hertz, I forget what it was, uh, uh, um, pattern that's happening across the brain, that must be the source of consciousness. Well, it's there in this microprocessor too. Uh, because there's no, they, they did this with no model of computation. They just tried to examine it in the same way they, they uh, 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 examined uh, brains. And you know, if you look at the luminance on the screen, there are Simple tuning with simple peaks, some transistors are only very related to the, to the, to the luminance in a simple way. Some have more complex curves. Oh, they must be very clever luminance transistors. It, it, when you know the model, it doesn't make sense. So, in order to understand a model computer, or 6502 is not exactly a model, that was you know, one of the first 8 bit processors. Uh, for, for 65 and 2, the Apple 2, I think. Um, uh, in order to understand it, you have to, well, it looks like you have to actually understand computation in order to figure out what's going on. So maybe the stuff, that yellow circle I had before, for understanding the brain or for understanding the evolution, you have some hypothesis there to figure it out, and we're just poking around and not getting very far. So, you know, that's what I mean by the juice. Some people take that paper and think, Oh, it's the stuff that I'm working on. That's, uh, that's what the juice is. No, it's a way of thinking about it. Um, the juice has to have explanatory power across many, many domains. It has to be some mode of explanation, of great computation. So, uh, and, 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 and there will be something, if it exists, there will be something like computation, or like quantum mechanics, or like calculus, which is a tool. It's not a thing, it's not a type in the universe, but it's a way of thinking. Something new. And that's what I we look for in the juice. And maybe we need to figure that out before we ever make real progress in either AI or A life. Um, I know this from people here being saying that A life needs to become better known in the world. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> AI is well known in the world, and it's just a zoo the way people are thinking about it. You don't want that. Just be quiet. <laughs> be happy. Think deep thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, it's not the silly dog. Yes. Oh. Okay. Um, so the first question is. Um, yeah, so this one is. Lana. Uh, mm -hmm. Lana. Yeah, Lana. Is it on here? So thank you for your very interesting talk. Uh, I think most people think that metaphors are very useful to think about things and we get insights from them. So when do we know when, when the metaphor for stops being useful and becomes harm harmful? That's the problem, isn't it? Um, you know, physical intuition was great for physics in many ways, still is, but it was, didn't work for quantum. Um, so, uh, you know, my, my meta version of dealing with metaphor is when the arguments start to get so ridiculous. Um, but on the other hand, th you know, there's a set of complaints about physics right now. This is a belief too much in simplicity and beauty. Um, and so maybe that meta meta was not the right thing either. No, science is, a, science is, is tough. 
It's hard. There is no, there is no straightforward answer. Um, but we have to try and recognize all that, digging ourselves too deep. Oh, by, by the way, if the Wi-Fi doesn't work, so people cannot uh, put a uh, ah. on the studio. That's a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, yes. So you can read better than... Joe, John, please. Yeah, John, yeah. I invite him to. By the way, I, I referenced you on that paper page. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's a microphone. So, I, I, it's a very challenging stance that you've taken, similar to Penrose took on AI. Um, but in any life, one of, the, one of the fields that we've had in evolutionary robotics, we simulate the robots inside physical simulations, and we've been somewhat successful at converting them into reality without saying that we needed to simulate down to the quantum level. Right. And you were, you, you, the, the, that reference in that paper was to you. Right. The work you right. Positive, so, which was, I think, so I'm the only I'm, work that indicated that was doable. Right. And, and so, so the thing is, so maybe I'm a reductionist materialist. That's not good. Uh, I might be. I'm proud. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and I think it's okay to be. That's I am too. But and, yeah, yeah. And, and the metaf you know the metaphors that we use in a life, uh, you know, we are trying to be scientists, right? More than more than philosophers. Though I I loathe the fact that there's hundreds of AI philosophers and and neurophilosophers and cognitive philosophers, but there are very few A-life philosophers yet. Maybe that's the same thing, we should just keep our head down because they can ruin the field. Yeah, but I'm trying to say it's slightly different, but get me a question then I'll... Yeah, so are you guilty of becoming a Penroseian oh. uh, towards A-life? Well, Steen, Steen uh, Rasmussen yesterday accused me of, when I, talk, when I was going to talk about it, he accused me of being old. Um, that's what old people talk about. Uh, so I, I come to it. I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing. By the way, I think Penrose is wrong. I think Chalmers is wrong. Uh, I, I was using them as being dismissive because they go outside of the materials reductionist sort of. Thing. I'm not looking for a way outside of that. It's just that you know, if you take the 19th century material. Productionism, it doesn't include computation. And we know computation works in the physical world. There's no question. It it goes down the this right on, right on top of Newtonian. Right? Right on top of Newtonian, except that we only use quantum. But you know, apart from those details. But but it sits right there, but it's a, been a very fruitful way to think about the world, having computation as as a as a, as, a, as another metaphor. Um, so that's what I'm looking for. I don't, Hopefully, hopefully we don't have to go outside of material reductionism. I'm, I'm saying maybe the way in it, in the same way that computation was not around in the 19th century, is around now, but does not in any way undermine that material reductionism. Maybe that's what makes sense for You know, like calculus is a tool. Maybe we just don't have the right set of tools. You know, we talk about criticality in, in, uh, in uh, cellular autonomy, uh, or cellular automata. Um, we, uh, we look at uh, uh, ratchet effects in Parando's paradox. We look across all. We look at uh, open evolution, which we heard about yesterday. Maybe they're all the way to talk about them. There's all instances of some other thing, like computation, and maybe in that framework that we find a commonality that we're not seeing right now. They're, they're sort of isolated things to worry about. But maybe there's some. And maybe so. Maybe I'm a romantic. I'm looking for. I'm looking for some, something that ties things together. When we evolve stuff in the real world, when you do direct evolution of chemistry or evolution in synthetic biology or evolution on robots, there's an expectation that the evolution process can find emergent uh, features or functions that we might not have predicted or modeled if we do it in software. And so we do maintain that line of research. It's just a very expensive line of research. Yeah, and maybe with the right to tools. Maybe with the right tools, we can do things analytically. And, and you know, when yesterday, um, Ken, I don't know, where's Ken? Ken yeah. Yesterday, Ken, you know, you came up with sets of, uh, you came up with, for open evolution, you came up with sets of principles of what had to be there. Um, 
And it, that was sort of ad hoc in the sense you, you know, we're trying to figure out what that might be. Maybe there are some theorems about, you know, there has to be this sort of uh, local interaction between sub descriptions which has this sort of property and then that leads to certain sorts of things. And maybe we just don't know about that. I wasn't, yeah, okay. yeah, let's move on to the other. Uh, oh, we've got Wi-Fi. Yeah, 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 I think the Wi-Fi is, is now up and properly. Why is an evolution logic? No, see, evolution, no, that, 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 that's, that's what, that's, it's not what I mean. It's not, it's not that there's a thing out there, it's an analytical way of thinking. The juice is an analytical way of thinking. Where, where is it? It's wrong. Oh, yeah, so I'm, 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 Now, common mistake about thinking like we have to think like a physicist. And one of the key things from philosophy of biology is that a basic explanatory uh, process is evolution. You don't need to go further than that. In fact, it's a mistake to go further than that. And so, it itself, whether it's instantiated in computation or something else, functions as an explanatory level. So, I'm thinking, what do you think is missing from that? Because I, I didn't understand that relation. Okay. Your you, you, so, we can talk about, we can talk about um, silicon um, in terms of the way things work in silicon. But it's the notion of the abstraction of computation which helps us think about and have theorems about what that silicon can do. We know that certain things can't be done under certain time frames or cannot be done at all by silicon, the whole thing problem, for instance. So it's an analytical tool, which just saying evolution doesn't give you the analytical tool. I'm looking for the analytical tool that will help to describe what is the range of evolution, what are the parameters under which it works, where you have to set the parameters, oh, we turn this knob too far, it's going to fall apart. Uh, a, a sort of predictive model that you could build from this analytical tool. It doesn't exist, that's why it's hard to think about. But it's not just that. Because if it was just that, we've had evolution in our AI life systems, they still don't work with work. shit. Sorry, everyone. They just don't. <laughs> um, so we're not getting that. We don't have open the evolution. You know, we do not have it. So we, we don't. We're not. We haven't solved it. Basically, what's evolution? Yeah. Okay, um, Josh. Okay. We're just, yes, Josh. I, I think that question now is redundant. But let me rephrase it. So <laughs> if uh, this is the approach to the juice. Is there any... No, no, so, so he's thinking about it wrong. We don't measure calculus. Right, right. We don't measure computation. It's a way of thinking. Okay. That's what the juice is, a way of thinking. What about empiricists then? What, what can we do then? Is it, is it only... Is analysis the only approach to the juice? Is there any... No, uh, 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 empiricism, empiricism gives us data to start to figure this out. You know, uh, Newton, Newton didn't supposedly, you know, the apple fell on his head, blah, blah, blah. True, but um, uh, uh, you know, it was empiricism that he was trying to make sense of that he came up with a, a way of thinking about calculus um, from all these different sorts of things that were happening and saw some pattern. So I'm not saying don't do empirical research, and I'm just saying don't. We may not get where we want to be without some deep thinking. Okay. Thank you. And I may be being totally romantic. This yeah. Way. Uh, how it comes across. Okay, Dave. Uh, oh, yeah. Dave. You're, um, uh, you're definitely old. Thank uh, you. Uh, <laughs> I, I <still> <laughs> well, so that is computation in the sense of computability starts out by discarding space and time. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It just can you do it or can you not? And that is a very limited sense of computation. Yeah, and it's one, computational. An important one, blah, blah, blah. but a very limited one. And to then turn around and say a life is victim to the same uh, liabilities that computability brings with it is missing, I think, the fact that a life is all about embodiment. And embodiment is, in fact, the question marks in your yellow circle. If you're out looking for a mysterious other thing, it's it's actually in the real world. It has space and time. It has to deal with light, speed, and so on and so forth. And those constraints are going to be enough to tame computation, and we've got it, and they don't. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me try to explain why I disagree. What I'm saying is that we 
we, us AI people, um, do most of our experiments in computation. And perhaps that computation is not powerful enough. It's not powerful enough. If we use silicon computers, we cannot simulate quantum effects. We cannot do it. But we can simulate them as well as we wish. No, we can't. We cannot. That's that. Why, why is everyone trying to, put, trying to build qubits? Because they can do stuff that you can't do with conventional computers. So there's, there's a different complexity class. If, if you think quantum is the answer, then we can have a separate arm. I'm not, I don't think quantum is I the answer. I don't think you did, so. No, I'm using, the, I'm using the, that as an example of where computation is not enough. There's a place where we know computation is not enough. Sure. It's well established. It is not enough. Sure. Is computation enough? truly generate evolution. Yes. He says no, he agrees with me, he's my buddy. <laughs> um, and but in AI life we use the computational tool that cocaine we've been getting, you know, for the last fifty years. So we use that because it keeps getting better, it keeps getting better and you know we think some, we'll some of us are building new architectures in silicon. Okay. But they're not CPUs. And, and they're not GPUs and they're not even determined. I and yet, I need, I need them to be computation. I need not to be tarred with the brush that you seem to be determined to tar us with. I'm trying to say, think, think wider. Oh, That's come to my talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I'm not trying to put anyone down. I'm trying to... Okay. Uh, uh, your work has been very influential uh, for me, so I'm really happy about this occasion. I'm here. Um, so to personally ask this question to you. I have two short questions. Like, I, was I was wondering what, what you consider the difference between uh, metaphors and models. So I didn't quite get that. And the other question is, um, so I, I also didn't get the difference between reduction reductionism and layers of abstraction. So layers of abstraction. Yeah. So those are, if you can, if you can comment on those two things. That would oh, well, be I, I think layers of abstraction are how we do reductionism. So that's, I don't see any particular issue there. Um, and I, 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 I view myself as a materialistic reductionist, material reduction, you know. I think that's how it is. Mm -hmm. I, I just am not sure we, we have the right tools to do it. So your, your first question was? The difference between metaphors and models. Ah, so there's two, there's two things there. There's, there's models and, you know, so in, in, in the, because f is equal to ma is a model, right? Right, right. So I was going to say Schrodinger's equation is a model, yeah. but physicists get tied up with the metaphor of when's it a particle, when's it a, a wave, and they get confused because it's not either one of them exactly, it's something else. So they're trying to use that metaphor that they're used to using of um, stuff in the physical world that we view as everyday experience applied to quantum, and quantum has a model which is Schrodinger's equation. Mm -hmm. um, but that metaphor doesn't work with that, and if you try and squeeze it into the metaphor, you're not know, thinking about it. So there's a whole bunch of different issues there, all, all going on at the same time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so this was actually my question, and I'm. Yeah. Oh, could I be a bit more? Yeah. Yeah. Me? Of course. Yes. Yeah. So, so I think this relates a lot to what David was saying. So computation, uh, you know, we have some definitions of it. But those feel very much more like a metaphor than what computation actually is. So could it be that you're operating under this metaphor of what computation is, and that's kind of limiting the way you're viewing all of these yeah, things? Yeah, yeah, could be. But I hate to think that you know, of all people, David Ackley is the one who's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Was a great talk.
maybe for your souvenirs. And we also have a banquet today from 7 o'clock. So, and then we actually have extra tickets only for banquets for 5,000 yen. So if you have friends and families that you want to bring to, to the banquet, please buy the tickets on VTX. And last but not least, we have the anti-harassment policy for the conference. So please respect the policy. Yeah, thank you. And that today is a workshop day and it starts after the break. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.